So, Jenna, let's start off with your high school career and let's focus on the academic stuff first. You went to a, a really quality public high school. There's a few people on there from that high school or from that area. Um, and you also went to a magnet school, a public magnet school for math and science half the day. So you, uh, you had an opportunity to take a lot of advanced coursework. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So the, well, first of all, the magnet school that I'm in is called Kamsey for any of you that don't know, Kamsey Area Math and Science Center. Um, and so since I was in kind of two programs, I took AB, AP and IB classes. So I took, um, like IB English, IB Spanish, IB history. Um, and then on the AP side, I took AP government, um, AP chemistry, AP biology, AP calculus. And you didn't do the whole IB diploma because of CAMSI, right? Because there was a conflict with the math. Um, and I think a couple other little requirements in there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And weighted, what was your, uh, what was your GPA weighted? Uh, it ended up to be a 4.88. And unweighted? Uh, about 3.98. Okay. So, I mean, very strong academic record, not a surprise. Although I do tell people that, and I remember having this conversation with you about physics, right? Because AP physics at Kamsey, is that, that's what it was, right? Where you were, yeah. That AP physics at that magnet school is an incredibly challenging course. That a B here and there is fine. It's okay not to be perfect. So don't anything that you hear tonight about Jonah's successes, that doesn't mean you have to be Jonah. You shouldn't try to be. You should try to be whoever you are. Um, back to your academic stuff, what were your AP and IB exam scores like? Were they pretty good? Uh, yeah, they my APs, they range between a four and a five, and my IBs range between a five and a six. Um, well, for APs, the scores are from one to five. IBs, it's uh, one to seven. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had good preparation. My teachers were very good, and that facilitated me in receiving good scores. Good. So yesterday I had one of my juniors, and this is a question I get a lot this time. And in fact, the person I just finished with right before this call was in this boat. And this, this young woman said to me yesterday, she said, I want to know how to take this course load I've got, how to prepare for the SAT, and how to do my extracurriculars without being absolutely miserable, without going crazy. How do I do that? And so I, I thought about you partially because we were leading up to this, but you really excelled at managing your time. Can you talk to us about some of the philosophy you had behind that, some of the tricks you used? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I wouldn't say it's objective, but I think that your junior year, is your most difficult year. I think it's a very popular opinion among people. I have that opinion, um, yeah. Yeah, your workload is cumbersome, very dense. And I think to, to manage that, I did a couple of things. Um, I think I did a very good job with prioritizing my tasks with respect to uh, when those things have to be done and how much time I have to put into them. Um, also, I always kept my goals in mind, like where I want to go, um, how doing something well will influence me in the future. Uh, and also, I'm going to sound like a parent, but, you know, getting enough sleep. I think that was also very important for me. Yeah, I think that's important for a lot of people, including myself. And I'd add to that, that my experience with you has always been that you uh, prioritize outcome as opposed to time on task. And by that, I mean that when you're working, you're working. You can make yourself miserable for four hours or you can do it for two if you put down your phone. And so that, that kind of getting into the habit of just focusing on one thing, multitasking doesn't work, right? That just focusing on one thing is something that I've seen you know, full disclosure, you've also done some work for me, you know, both this last summer and, and over break. I've seen you excel at that. All right. So what did you do outside of class? So uh, talk to me about your school-related activities. Uh, yeah, so 
Uh, first of all, I was a Spanish tutor from sophomore year to uh, senior year. You know, I met um, some tutorees uh, like two to three times a week. Um, I also um, was involved in DECA, which is a business competition. Um, so in my IB business class, I you know practiced a lot for that. And then I made it to the state competition for both years I did it. Um, and then also um, in Kamsey, which is the magnet school, I was involved in a research team, uh, which allowed me to have extracurricular research um, with an organic chemist at Pfizer. Um, we looked into water quality um, and I won the junior water prize at the ICEF regional fair. And I think research team was a big credibility boost to your application because you did the same project for two years, which is somewhat rare on you know, research teams. And also you guys had sort of measurable work output, you know, as far as that goes. So I think that that really uh, upped your credentialing. Um, talk to me about sports. Uh, yes. Yeah, so pretty much for all my life, I played soccer. Um, when I got to uh, high school, um, I played on the junior varsity team for my freshman year. I got pulled up at the end of the year and then I was to, to the varsity team. And then um, I played varsity throughout the rest of my high school career. I was captain in my senior year um, and we won a district championship in my senior year. So that was cool. Um, and I also uh, was involved in um, club soccer, which took place in the spring and the high school soccer took place in the fall. And you um, competed club soccer sort of on a national level. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So pretty much every weekend I would go to different States like Iowa, even made it to Florida one time to you know play different teams from all over the country. Now, when it, whenever you're playing at a high level like this, college sports is a consideration. What, role did college sports play in your determination of where you looked at or was it a deter was it a determining factor at all um so do you mean just like uh, how much did you care about being able to kick a soccer ball in college oh okay okay um i mean yes yeah, so i mean i'm not good enough to play division one <laughs> <laughs> um but in my junior year, I was actually really considering playing soccer at a um, Division three school. Um, I really wanted to play at like Williams or Amherst. Um, but then um, I know, just after a while, I just um, realized that, you know, maybe that's not something I want to do in college. I'd rather focus on my studies. Um, yeah, it's just different for everyone, I would say. It is. It's a different thing for everybody. And I think that being flexible to, and that's kind of how I remember you playing it is those colleges you mentioned, Williams and Amherst were on your list, right? Mm -hmm. But you had options going both directions, whether, you know, Duke, I won't play these colleges. I could play. Right. Exactly. Um, and outside of school stuff, you were very active in your synagogue. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah. So I adhere to the Jewish tradition. Um, so, um, and I have a, I think I have a large commitment to my religion. So I decided to be a Hebrew school teacher. Um, specifically I helped elementary school and pre-K kids with their prayers and understanding certain Jewish concepts. Ultimately I was looking to prepare them for their bar mitzvahs, um, and bat mitzvahs. Um, I was also part of a congressional campaign in the summer of 2018. Um, and I also did some tutoring for Syrian refugees at our local Islamic center. Okay. Now that everybody has a pretty good biography of what Jonah looked like on paper to the admissions committee, let's start shifting into admissions. So um, looking back, before we do that, looking back, what activity was the most important to you or do you have one? Um, I think that the one that was most important to me was being the Hebrew school teacher. Um, 
I mean, just Judaism is a huge part of my life and being able to, you know, apply that to people in my community was a very big thing. And it was very significant because there's not many Jewish people in my, the town of Kalamazoo. Um, so I played a really important role in, you know, younger kids attaining pride in their religion. So that was very important to me. It's nice to have an older juvenile role model, especially for little kids. Um, what do you think was most important from an admission standpoint? Any conjecture on that? Um, yeah, so wait, when you say admission stamp, just like the getting in. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, for me, um, I think I'll take that in the perspective of your extracurriculars. Um, so I think what admissions officers look for is you not trying to just participate in a boatload of activities um, and in activities that you might not enjoy very much. Um, they would rather see you do, you know, less activities that you love. So, um, things that you want to put effort into things that you're passionate about. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I agree completely. I think for, for almost everybody and almost to a point that it's a fault in the system, but I think that almost for everybody, depth of involvement where you have two years on a research team, you have captain of the soccer team, years of travel soccer, uh, blah, 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 not the blah, 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 here, many accomplishments. Um, those look, those show consistency and all that. And I, but at the same time, you shouldn't just, you know, shouldn't not do things and try them out or keep doing something you don't like. All right, Jonah, um, let's do, let's sort of do a little timeline um, let's talk about your testing first, right? So, uh, you went to Duke, so you obviously just took the test one time and got an almost perfect score and never took the SAT again, right? I wish. <laughs> Didn't work that way for most people, even if you end up at Duke or Harvard. So you had kind of a little bit of a longer road, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, you want me to talk about, like, SAT, ACT? Whatever you want to talk about. Whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, we we tried both with you for a couple of reasons. One being I was trying to walk around the SAT level twos. And two, we were trying to get your verbal stuff up anyway. And uh, we tried the ACT a few times, which is why in the email – that I sent out to everybody, I said, find out why 30 is Jonah's least favorite number um, because you got stuck at a plateau. Um, so this is something that happens to some people and it's really hard to predict who it's going to happen to or when it's going to happen, to, at least for me. It is. How, you, how you respond to that is really important. Can you tell us like about being stuck at a score that you didn't exactly want and how you dealt with it and what helped you break out of it? Um, yeah. So to allude to my response about, you know, juggling different responsibilities we talked about earlier. Um, I, I just kept my end goal in mind and that was to, you know, really strive for success in my future and, um, being able to have a good test score is, I think, is an element of that. Um, so just constantly thinking that, you know, I want to be here in like X number of years. Um, just keeping that in the back of my mind just gave me encouragement. And also Jacob was very encouraging throughout the whole process. So, yeah. And so then what happened? We, we said see you later ACT right and then what happened to you uh yeah so yeah we switched from the ACT to the SAT and don't be afraid to do that guys or vice versa yeah um and I I think I wasn't getting where I wanted to be on the ACT because of the time component uh I think the ACT is um it's a faster test, you know, you have less time to do a um, certain amount of questions. And I think that the pressure associated with that 
was really taking a toll on me. Um, so switched over to the SAT. Um, but I think the experience I got from studying for the ACT really helped me with the SAT. Um, I think just the idea of, you know, having to manage your time, I think that was a really big advantage for me when going into the SAT. Um, I got the score that I wanted and yeah, it was good from there. So yeah. And you ended up with, uh, 1500. So that Mm -hmm. was a 780 on the math section and 720 on the reading and writing section. And once you're really, I say 1520, but once you're at a 1500, 1520, more doesn't help hardly at all. And it really becomes an inefficient use of your limited time. Because if you're the kind of person that's applying to a school where you think a 1540 over 1500 might matter, then you're probably so busy that you'd be better off doing something more meaningful than getting those extra 40 points. The, the, at a 1500 to a 1540, is, it's, it's de minimis. I mean, you've proved the concept that you can do well. Uh, talk about what worked for you as far as practicing for the test, routine you got into, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so, um, like, as I said before, uh, the time was one of my main areas of concern. Um, so that's why the ACT didn't work for me. I mean, it was still a little bit of a problem for the SAT, but, um, cause I think that the, the perfectionist behavior inside of me wanted, wanted me to take extra time to assure that I'm hundred percent confident in each question, but in reality, you don't have time to do that. Yeah. Perfect think, is the enemy of a great score. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that doing time practice sessions was very beneficial to me. You know, I would do a full uh, math section in the allotted time um, on actual test day. And I would do that a couple of times. And I did that for reading and writing also. That was very helpful for me. Good. Um, going back, what would you change about everything we did with you with testing? What would you do differently? Um, yeah, so for me, um, my mindset with studying for the SAT and the ACT was, you know, if I have nothing else going on, then I would study for the SAT or the ACT. However, when if you have that kind of mindset, there are times when you have that extra time that you would rather just relax rather than study. So I think that a better a better approach is to, you know, set a certain amount of time you're going to study each day and like be specific about it. Like, for example, say you're going to study 45 minutes after school uh, every day for a certain amount of weeks. Um, I think that when you do that, you can assure yourself that, you know, you'll get a sufficient amount of practice uh, in a certain amount of time. Good answer. All right. So let's talk about your applications. We're about to get to that, Joe. Um so how many schools did you end up applying to? Uh, yeah, I think I applied to about 18, 19, or 20. So a lot. Is it that many? <laughs> so walk in, So you had two rounds of application. So those of you who don't know yet, early decision is a bonding thing. You can only apply to one school early decision. And that means you can't apply some places even early action, which is non-bonding. Um, so Jonah loved Duke, blah, blah, decided to go to Duke early action. Uh, why, did, why Duke early action? Because that's a, that's a commitment. What made you make that choice? Uh, yes. Yeah, so as Jacob said, it's binding. So if you get in, you have to go. So you have to be like completely sure that if you get in, that's the place you want to go to. And it, that was simple for me because – found that Duke has a great balance between academics, uh, athletics, um, student life, and, you know, a great campus. So it was all there for me, and it was a simple choice for me, I think. I, you know, I talked to somebody recently, and they're like, do you think I should apply somewhere early decision to? And I said, if you're asking me, you probably shouldn't. 
because I think you need that level of internal commitment to where you know with uh, metaphysical certitude, like you just are knowing your gut that this is the school I want to go to bar nothing before you pull that trigger. Because the last thing I want to see happen, and it's not super common, but somebody do that and then have get in and have buyer's remorse, right? It's a lousy way to start your college career. So you applied to Duke Early Decision and then Michigan and UVA. Or what was the other place you applied early action? Yeah, you got it. Those, those three? Those, yeah. Okay. So Mich- Duke and Early Decision, um, Michigan and UVA, Early Action. So that was completely within the rules. And then the thing about Early Decision is you find out right before Christmas, find out right in the middle of the holiday season, if you got in, you're deferred or you're rejected. Uh, so tell us what happened, you know. Uh, yeah, so it turns out I was deferred. Um, so what that means is that, um, the admissions officers either want to see how you are with respect to the regular decision applicant pool, um, or they want to see other things that you participate in over the next couple of months. Um, and, or they just want to like wait on you and see, um, if they eventually decide that you're the right fit for them. Um, so yeah, I was disappointed. That's a pretty uh, big gut punch, I think. Yeah. It kind of changed my winter break because <laughs> mine too. <laughs> yeah. Cause I had a lot more essays to write. Um, I guess in the scenario that I wouldn't get into Duke, I'd want to apply yeah. to other places too. And that happens. In fact, somebody that's on this chat is, is sort of in this boat, boat now where didn't if you don't get in your early decision, then you gotta you have to really pick up the pace. You have about two and a half, three weeks to pump out a bunch of applications. And these are not colleges where you just hit the submit button on the common app. These are ones with one, two, three, four, five, six supplemental essays. So I want to talk about your essays. Let's let's back up in time and talk about your common app. You know, what I generally tell people is let's write as many of your essays over the summer before your senior year as we possibly can to manage the flow. And you did a pretty good job with that. Talk about the process of writing your common app. It was not um, an exercise you were, had really done before or something you were super familiar with. So I think you had a bit of a learning curve to it. Uh, yeah, so I want to say in about July, we started this process. Um, so Jacob prompted me to simply write about my life. He termed that as a free write. <laughs> um, <laughs> and specifically write about your life and what you've learned from the experiences that you've had. Um, so after I did that, Jacob and I kind of centralized on a certain topic that we thought best exemplified the kind of person that I am. And um, that formed a solid narrative to display to admissions officers. Um, Do you mind to tell us a little bit about what you wrote about? Yeah, so I ended up writing about the passing of one of my Hebrew school teachers um, and how that experience affected me. I mean, she, the, my teacher, um, she died of stomach cancer and she put a massive emphasis on a certain Jewish attribute called, uh, tikkun olam, which means to, um, seek to repair the world. You know, we should all do that. And I kind of talked about how, um, I want to continue her legacy with that specific topic and make the world a better place. Um, and it ended up being an essay also about being Jewish in a small, predominantly Christian town and how you, that helped you have a perspective of understanding minorities in other situations. And so you really, you were able to create a holistic picture of a person who makes mistakes but it's trying to get better and trying to learn more about the world. 
And that's what more or less what everybody should try to do with their own story. And, you know, anything can make a good common application essay as long as you care about it and it, and it was important to you or is important to you. Um, we had a question. What was your second choice school? Um, my second choice school was, um, hmm. I mean, mainly I had a, I had a top four at the end. Um, so like Duke was number one. And I think like tied underneath that was, um, Michigan, Notre Dame and Williams college. So I don't really think I had like one second choice. I didn't really make the decision of, you know, what stands out among my stack on my second choice, but yeah. Uh, well, one more question. We'll get back to essays. Uh, the, the, your adoring fans want to know what your record was. They're champ. So how many did you win? How many did you lose? And how many did you get whitelisted? Uh, yes. Yeah, so at the end of the process, I had, um, so I got into Duke, um, Williams, Michigan, Notre Dame, Wake Forest. I think those were five got I got into. Um, and and then I had about like 10 wait lists. Yeah, you had a lot of wait lists. So that was a bit frustrating, but... Wait, just a word for a bit. Wait lists were unusually common last year, I think because of the upset in COVID. Um, you saw a lot of colleges that weren't sure how many people to admit because they weren't sure about matriculation rates. And small colleges like high-end colleges, like your Williams and so, you know, so on and so forth, are really susceptible. Like a 10% drop in enrollment could really crush them. So I think you saw a lot more wait lists. And you saw, to some extent, more people come off of wait lists last year. Uh, and really, I don't think you applied to 20 schools. Yeah, it's like, it's like 12. Yeah. <laughs> Feels like 20. Yeah. I know my man who's on here tonight, Rahib, can agree with that. He's in he's in that boat right now where he's finishing up his last ones. Um but uh yeah, you did a good job and you turned around, you know, after it is a big hit. And again, like how you respond to these hits is really important. Uh, and in my experience, that makes as much difference as almost anything else you do when you have an admission setback or a testing setback. You know, you did take a few days, I think, and then we got to work on those supplementals and you cranked out 20 or 30 essays in, you know, tw you know three weeks or less. So talk about the writing process you have for supplemental essays. Um, yeah, so... Um, it was a bit similar to the common app, you know, outlining your ideas and then just going from there. Um, but one very helpful idea is that um, the prompts for different colleges, they tend to be similar with one another. Um, Jacob calls that recycling essays. I don't know if he coined that, but uh, pretty much what that means uh, is that you can um, use the ideas of one essay and then pretty much display the exact same narrative in another essay. Um, that doesn't mean simply copying and pasting like one prompt and putting it into another prompt. Um, you have to do a little bit of restructuring to, I guess, fully fit the exact prompt. But, yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's a little bit like tacking on sentences here and there. And sometimes you're just writing the same essay from a slightly, you're shifting two feet to the left and writing the same essay. Um, but once you have, because what happens with supplementals, and you'll remember this, Jonah, is you have the same kind of prompts show up over and over again, community, identity, why X, Y, Z college, right? Um, activity and what well, I'm missing something, but you know, you can get a lot of mileage out of those essays. Uh, I have a guy right now who's sent the same, roughly the same essay about pickleball, which is like old people tennis, to f probably five colleges. Um, 
I don't see anything else on that. So uh, where else? I, don't I lost my. Ch I made an outline so I didn't go on tangents today, folks. As those of you who know me know that I do. Um, let's talk about. Let's get back to Duke. Uh, how did you follow up with Duke in between the period of deferment to regular admission decision? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, what you're allowed to do is send supplemental materials after you're deferred. Um, you do that to your regional advisor. Um, I guess I got an email from my regional advisor a couple weeks after I got deferred that I would send him the stuff that I want Duke to see. Um, and to be honest, I think I kind of annoyed him because I kind of, sent him a ton of information. Um, I sent him two or three more letters of recommendation, um, an update of what I've achieved um, since I sent in my early decision application in November. And then also just another message or I think it was like a letter um, for why Duke is still my number one choice. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. So you covered your bases. Yeah. And anybody that's in that situation needs to do that. You need to have positive contact with the school and you need to be persistent. And there's a way to annoy people in a good way and a way to do it in a bad way. And so you should always ask somebody before you go on to annoy somebody in which way you're doing it, because it's really hard to tell from your own perspective. I personally have never figured it out. Um, so what was it like you got in? So what was that like? Uh, I mean, yeah, that'll be an, an experience I'll always remember. You know, March 27th at 6.55. Like, I'll, I'll always remember that that point in time because, I mean, there's no greater feeling than achieving a long-term goal, um, especially a goal that you've um, invested a lot of time and effort into trying to achieve. So it definitely – an amazing experience. Yeah, it made my week. I can tell you that. We worked we worked on that for a long time, and I thought you really deserved it, and I still do. Um, and then you decided, well, just getting into Duke isn't enough, so I'm going to apply to a selective thing within Duke. Can you tell us what you applied for? Uh, yeah, so um, a lot of colleges have things like these. Uh, it's called a living learning community. Um that means that, you know, you get to be put in a certain section of the dorms where you um, are around the people that you have classes with. Um, so that means that, you know, you get to like, walk with these kids to your different classes and stuff like that. And uh, specifically, the, li the living learning community for me was an interdisciplinary program that looks to combine the disciplines of modeling and uh, economics, psychology, and sociology. Um, modeling is in quantitative modeling, not Joan on a runway. Oh, yeah. But, well, a lot of people don't know. But yeah, it's really neat. And you had to write a couple essays for that. Yeah. And then they accepted, what, half of you guys or something, I think? Uh, yeah, I think it was something like that, yeah. And what was your experience like with that? What's what's that been like now that you're done with your first semester? Uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend doing things like that because it's a great source of community. Um, you get to learn and um, you get to learn a lot of cool things. Um, and also, it's really easy to meet people when you're in these communities um, because you're literally going to classes with them. And you're working on a project with them. And, I mean, you're just a couple of doors down from them in the dorms. So I would definitely recommend doing stuff like that. And so talk to us about the people at Duke. Is it really competitive? I, no, I, um, that was something I was really worried about going in. Um, but I've noticed that Duke has a great sense of collaboration over competition. Um, you know, it's not a place where people like rip out pages in the libraries to 
give them a, a leg up on other people. Um, people want to help you and like we all have the same goals and it's just a sense of community at Duke that I love. And yeah. So what was most surprising about college? Um, most surprising. I think um, it was like how easy it was to meet people. Um, in the first couple of weeks of school, I realized that everyone pretty much has the same goal and that's to meet other people because um, pretty much for everywhere you go, you, know, you don't know a lot of people. Um, and that's especially the case at a private school um, where, um, and not for, a your home school, I guess the one, in, the public school that's, I guess, in your state, um, because you literally don't know anyone. And I just realized that, you know, we're all trying to meet each other and mm -hmm. it was very easy to do that. So transitioning to college isn't easy. And it's not probably any easier with COVID. A lot of the advice that I give and people like me give is, basically smile and say hello to people and half of that's out the window. Um, so what's it like being a college freshman on campus with COVID? How, uh, how do you socialize and how do you interact? Uh, yeah, so it's, it was definitely different. Um, you know, I definitely did not have the standard freshman year of college. Um, a lot of places, unfortunately, didn't allow kids back on campus, but Duke did. So I was very fortunate for that. Um, so Duke was very committed to you know, letting people come back, forming a sense of community, and at the same time, keeping people healthy. Um, there was a lot of social distancing that Duke enforced. I was tested for COVID twice a week. So that ended up being about 35 to 40 COVID tests by, by the end of the semester. Um, so it really didn't hurt anymore. Um, <laughs> and to interact with people, um, what Duke wants us to do was um, see people outside. Um, and that was especially easy at Duke because the, the weather is, it allows for that. You know, it's pretty warm, sunny a lot of the times. Um, and that was even the case for late into November, you know, it was still nice weather. So sharing meals with people outside was, was preferred rather than having kids eat inside. Um, and yeah. All right. So what was the hardest part about transitioning to college? Um, I think for me, it was not being with my family. I'm a big family man. Um, you could kind of call me a little bit of a, of a mama's boy. <laughs> uh, I got, I got pretty homesick in the mm -hmm. first couple of weeks, but um, what college is about is adjusting to new environments. And I was able to do that, you know, learn to be away from my family to become independent, um, make your own schedule. You know, that, that just came over time. How did you get over the homesickness? Um, I mean, I did stay in contact with my family a lot. You know, I called my parents every day. Um, so that definitely helped. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, my parents and family weren't allowed to come visit me. And I wasn't allowed to go home. Uh, so that made it a little harder. But... Um, I think when I formed a good friend group, I was able to become more comfortable there. And that helped with the homesickness, I think. All right. So if you could go back in time and change one thing about your high school career, what would you change? Um, I think for me, um, I think I would like to go out of my comfort zone a little more. Um, that's definitely the thing I would change. You know, it's part of human nature to seek comfort because that's what you're used to. 
Um, but there's also a lot of new things that you can learn from stuff you're not familiar with. Um, so I'm, I'm a quiet guy, I would say. So, um, one thing I could have done was get involved with the student government because that's a position where you're required to be social. Um, so I think going out of my comfort zone, doing new things, I think that would, that would have been meaningful to me. That's a good answer. Thanks for your candor, Jonah. Um, questions from anybody. How many times did you take the SAT? And the, the ACT two or three, I don't remember the SAT. Yeah, I think the SAT, I took it twice. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Twice, maybe. Could have been three times. When did you start studying for the SAT? Um, so for, should I take that as? Like, when start? did you probably start with me? So yeah. you were sophomore year, something like that? Yes. Yeah, I would say sophomore year. I think it was in like February of my sophomore year. Um, you got serious about it over the summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think like even since then, like I wanted to go to a place like Duke. Um, I noticed that in my freshman year of high school that, you know, my, my grades were there. I was starting to get involved in, different things that made me look like a better applicant. So mm -hmm. I kind of got more serious about that. And that's where the studying really came into play. Yeah. I mean, you want to get serious, I think really in 10th grade, but you need to start really working on it somewhere around 11th grade for most people. And not everybody has Jonah's testing experience, you know, the goal with Jonah was to wrap him up early. It took longer than we expected. So we got him done at a nice time because it wasn't backing into his senior year. One of the things you don't want to try to avoid doing if you can is testing the fall of your senior year because then it's, one, it's do or die. That's not a condition you want to take a test in. And two, you have applications, senior year, athletics, whatever else you're involved in on top of it. It's It can be pretty daunting and when I have people in that situation, usually the end product doesn't work out as well. Um, they get through it, but it's miserable for everybody in their family. Um, uh, what do you think the biggest takeaway from the process was? Um, yeah, I think for me, it was the idea that um, like you're in the driver's seat of this whole thing. You know, you can control how much you study for the SAT, how much effort you put into your essays, um, how many extracurriculars you're involved in. Um, so it's it's really not about the mindset of like thinking you're not good enough to get into the place you want to get into. It's more about you know how much effort you want to put in, um, and. Just, yeah, that you're you're in the driver's seat. You control the situation, and I think I found comfort in that. Yeah, and at the same time, I think you recognized that there was a probabilistic aspect to this, right? That when you talk about schools that have low single, low double digits, high single digit admission rates, you could get into A and not B. And then somebody else could get in. And then, in fact, that happened your year. You got into Duke. You were waitlisted at Carnegie Mellon. A girl I worked with, similar in a lot of ways, waitlisted Duke and at Carnegie Mellon. So you, you're right. You, you control what you can control and then just take ownership of that and then accept that that's going to give you the best results. Um, what factors went into choosing your backup schools? Um, yeah, for me, um, I guess my general process was, um, you know, taking Duke, uh, noticing what I like about it. You know, I think I talked about the whole balance thing earlier and then I guess seeing what schools are analogous to Duke, you know, ones that have these similar, um, balances of academics, 
student life, athletics and campuses. Um, and that was the main way I chose my um, backups. Um, for me, I didn't do what a lot of people do, which is just, you know, shotgunning the Ivy League schools. It means that you literally just apply to every single one of them. And I personally don't like that because I feel like you're just doing that for the name um, of the, like the IV name um, for prestige and stuff like that. Um, so for me, I was a lot more specific and deliberate about, you know, what I want in a college. And I went from there. Good. All right. What else guys? What did you want out of a backup school? What I mean, what specifically when you say like Duke, like, what do you mean like Duke? Um, I mean, yeah, just uh, I guess I'll talk about uh, Notre Dame for example. Um, you know, their their academics are you know amazing. I was able to get into their business program there, uh, Mendoza, and I mean that's a solid program for a for a BBA degree. Um, so I was very satisfied with that. Um, when I visited there, the campus was beautiful. Uh, just amazing. It was stunning. And um, they got, they're in the ACC conference, which is a power five conference for sports. And, you know, they had a pretty good year in football this year. So they're, they're quite, I'm good at sports and just going there it made me just like the student life. You know, it seemed very lively there. And yeah. yeah. Um, I got one by text. How did your campus visits shape how you ranked your schools? Um, Hold on, two parters. My, my screen went off because I'm an old man. How did your campus visit shape how you ranked your schools? Were there any schools you weren't thinking of that you applied to based only on your visit? Good question. Um, so I think the campus visit was very significant for me. Um, I did a lot of my research prior to um, going to different campuses I wanted to visit. Um, and you know, I read up about each school I was going to go visit to. And I think that when I visited, you know, all that came to life. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's just a different element of, you know, actually being there physically rather than just reading up on a school. I think that, you know, it all comes together. And then I think one very important part about the visit is that um, if you enjoy the visit, then you know that you can see yourself there. Um, and it's much easier to visualize yourself at a certain college when you're actually there rather than just reading up. Yeah, that's the thing I think we don't think about, but college is an abstraction. And since you guys have not typically lived, even if you have lived in a few different places, never lived anywhere independently, I think that the campus visit is really important for families to talk about things like money and realities of living independently and expectations. And for you guys to really think, oh man, this is happening. I got to get my stuff together. Uh, not in your case, really, JP. Um, Wasn't, but, there part of the, oh, sorry? Wasn't there a second part of the question also? Yeah. But, uh, were there any schools that you applied to that Wait, were there any schools that weren't you weren't thinking of that you applied to? I don't know why I just didn't pick up my phone. That you were there. <laughs> I'll cut around this part for YouTube. Were there any schools you weren't thinking of that you applied to based only on the visit? It's only on the visit? Yeah, anybody that you were like, eh, and then you were sold on when you went and saw it. Um to be honest, for me, um, uh, my process wasn't like that. Um, I visited the schools that um, that I already knew, like that I loved. 
based on what I've read about them, all the research that I did. Uh, so for me, visiting the schools, like I already had a liking to them before I went there. I just wanted to see if you know I could really see myself there. I think that was the purpose of my visits. Yeah, I want to add a cautionary note about campus tours. So campus tours, there's actually several marketing agencies which compete to help redesign college campus tours. And there's an inverse correlation between student satisfaction at the institution that they go to, their college, and how important the campus tour was. So if they rank the tour really high as a deciding factor on the go there, then they tend to be less enthralled, they're less less happy at college. Uh, Never forget that those guided campus tours are informative, but they're very much an advertisement. They're very carefully curated, carefully timed, almost Disney World style syncopation uh, and orchestration to, to induce you to have that kind of feeling that at the end of the day, uh, the sales tactics for car dealers are not dissimilar than from schools. So take the tour, but spend a couple hours walking around by yourselves. All right. When did you do your college tours? What time of year? Did you do any interviews with advisors or students during your campus tours? Um, so I think I had a little bit of a unique experience because I have a sister that's one grade above me. So what that, uh, what that um, resulted in was me going on the tours with her. So um, that means I toured around, I think it was spring of my sophomore year. So that means that um, my sister was touring in uh, the spring of her junior year. Um, so yeah, I was definitely like one of the youngest people on the tours, but I mean, it was still a very meaningful experience for me. Um, so yeah, that's what we decided to do you know, spring of junior year leading up to your senior year? Yeah, spring is most common. Uh, I don't, in answer on my end, I don't know if it matters when you go. I mean, campuses will be prettier in the spring. It's better to go when students are in session because then you can get, especially if you go to college in a city like Ann Arbor or Morgantown or Blacksburg where the city exists because there is a ta- there is a college there. You can kind of get a better feel on what things like traffic and parking and other things are like. Um, and also another thing I want to add is that uh, I don't know when they'll start opening up college tours again. Um, like, for example, at Duke, they have no idea what the plan is for that. Um, but for me, um, in what I do in about March, like I wanted to, you know, visit a couple more places. Um, but you know, I couldn't because of COVID. So a lot of the schools did these virtual tours where you would just, you know, sign in and then they would kind of take you around the campus, like on your computer. Uh, so it was a very meaningful experience to do that, I think. Yeah, I think those are nice. I like that um, there's also you can get more information out of these. One of the nice things that's happened with COVID is these hour-long presentations about colleges have shrunk to to 12 minutes because nobody will watch a 59-minute video, but they'll sit there and be polite for 59 minutes. So you can get the same stuff in 12 minutes and you avoid a lot of the um, marketing speak and a lot of the fluff. So I think I, I do like those, those campus tours. Again, remember these are designed for that no small budget by marketing agencies. So remember that they're always remember that these are sales tools. Other questions. I think there was one more on, on that about the interviews. Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, 
Good job, Jonah. <laughs> Did you do? <laughs> it's my first time doing it. Did you do any interviews with your uh, with advisors or students during your campus tour? Um, actually, no, not for me. I think it might depend on the schools you're applying to, but the only interviews I had was um, for Duke. And that was because I applied to early decision. You know, they offer you an interview if you do that. Um, and then, then I also applied to university of Pennsylvania and they had me do a virtual interview with them after I applied to the school. Mm -hmm. So for me, there was no, um, like interviews during my campus tours. Yeah, the, in general, the way it works is you apply and then you get an interview. You can, however, set up a time usually to talk to somebody in admissions, and they'll do that with you. And that's not that's a good thing to do because it uh, shows your interest level is high. It's a good way for them to give you a, depending on who it is, a pretty good ish sometimes uh, assessment of what you got going on and uh, uh, target your application that way. So anytime you can interact positively with admissions is a good thing because they do keep track of that stuff. How did you choose your classes in high school? Hmm. Um, I mean, to be honest, there's, you don't have a, there's not a ton of room to be creative when you're choosing your classes in high school because there's a lot of core requirements that you need to fulfill. Um, but I knew for a long time that, you know, I want to do economics, um, go in the financial field, I think. Um, so in the magnet school that I was in, I did a lot of emphasis in uh, mathematics and statistics to, I guess, really develop that analytical side of things. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's it. Yeah, I think in Jonah's case, because he wanted to take as much IB as he could at his home school versus when he wasn't at his magnet school, there wasn't a lot of option. Um, he did have options at the Math Science Center, essentially choosing between science classes. But I think he was a little bit more restricted um, because of that. And still, if he had been taking a whole IB curriculum, he'd have been fairly restricted in that as well, just because the IB curriculum is so involved. Um, with the person that asked this, I think in his case, most of his AP offerings are virtual. So he probably has a wider array of things to choose from. And I would suggest trying to create e either logical course sequences or just taking things you like. Let's try this one more time. Okay, folks, if you guys don't have any more questions for Jonah, um, I just want to thank you from everybody. Uh, Jonah, I really appreciate your time and getting ready for this and doing this and uh, talking about things that didn't go well, which you know a lot of people don't want to do. So I can't thank you enough. I hope that everybody who came got something out of this. If you guys think of a question for Jonah or have a question for me, um, just text me or email me. Uh, I'm sure Jen would probably be happy to answer anything you guys have.